Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's call to go over the extended day ahead market draft tariff language. My name is Isabella Nicosia, representing ISO Stakeholder Affairs, and I'll be facilitating the web conference today. I'm also joined on the line by John Anders, our Assistant General Counsel, as well as some other folks from the EDM policy and legal team. So before we get started, I do want to share that the draft tariff language is available out on the EDM initiative webpage. Um, you can get to that page by going to kaiso.com, then you'll click on the state and form tab, and then policy initiatives. If you type in the search bar EDM, it'll pull up the initiative page, and then it should be posted there um, as the first activity on that page. And the draft tariff language is posted as several separate documents. Um, so make sure to review each one of those. Some other reminders before we kick things off, this call is being recorded. The recording is for informational and convenience purposes only. So any related transcription should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. And then if you need technical assistance during today at any point, you can send a chat to the event producer. Um, our event producer today is Silas. We will be pausing for questions throughout the call. So if you connected to audio through your computer um, or use the call me option through the WebEx, you can raise your hand by selecting the raise hand icon located at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you called into the conference separately or are not connected to WebEx, you'll need to press pound two to enter the queue. And then a reminder for everyone to please just remember to state your name and affiliation before making your comment or asking your question so that everyone on the phone knows who's speaking. And then you can also send a chat, uh, your question via the chat to me. Again, my name is Isabella Nicosia, or you can send it to all panelists. So the agenda for today, I'm going to hand it over here in just a second to John to start us off on the draft sheriff language walkthrough. Um, and that'll really be the bulk of today's call. And then when we wrap up, we'll go over some next steps, including some upcoming meeting dates and the comment deadline. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Anders. Thanks, Isabella. I um, I'm going to assume everyone can hear me still, so I'll just carry on unless uh, someone suggests otherwise. But uh, we wanted to take the opportunity, um, you know, early on in the comment period here. So we posted the draft tariff. Uh, uh, I guess it was um, March 30. So and we had a little spring breaks, hopefully, and uh, now it's uh, April 10. So comments are going to be due at the end of the month, and we thought it might be helpful to just kind of walk through the materials with everybody, orient uh, everyone to the material, um, you know, answer any questions and, and, and all of that. It's kind of a walkthrough. We will have uh, in-depth discussions that will follow from the stakeholder comments, and we'll get to that on next steps. So I just kind of wanted to lay the groundwork here. Um, you know, we can go any, anywhere you want to go with this, but that's the, the idea and the purpose for this particular meeting. And um, before I get started, um, I'll, I'll do a quick introduction of, the, of my colleagues here. So I'm joined uh, by others who have been assisting with the effort to prepare the tariff language for the extended day ahead market. And uh, we got Andrew Ulmer, uh, one of our other assistant general counsels. Uh, Bill Weaver, he's not on today, but he's also helping out. Uh, David Zlotlow uh, and uh, Heather Curley, Sarah Kozal, and then uh, we also have uh, uh, John Spomer, who's been working on some of the agreements. Also, we have James and and uh, and uh, Milos uh, on the on the subject matter expert side of, of things in case we get into those kinds of questions. I do now see Bill's joined, so welcome, Bill, and thanks, everybody. Um, you know, this, this slide, I don't know that we need to spend time going through it. It's just there for your convenience uh, as the PowerPoint uses a few acronyms. Some of these are probably familiar with everyone. Um, so I think if we just go on to the next slide, um, this is this is basically the material um, as it's been you know will be presented here. Uh, I've reordered things to kind of follow a different flow in, in the posting. They're ordered numerically and alphabetically as they would uh, 
be uh, in the tariff itself. What I would recommend as we go through each of the different uh, uh, bullet points on this slide, so section 33, we'll start with that. Most of the proposal and time will be spent on that, but we'll get through all of the materials in any event. Uh, I, I'd recommend if you do have a second screen, you know, just open it up and kind of scroll along, and uh, that may help um, either raise questions or you know, clarify things, because we won't be going over every every point that's brought up in, in the tariff or draft tariff language, but um, we, we will answer any questions that you might have on any of that. So um, this is the current sort of universe of uh, draft materials we have for the tariff. It, it, it may come to our attention that there's other provisions or sections um, and quite possibly some cleanup uh, in, in the balance of the tariff to, you know, make sure that we've covered everything uh, you know, additional definitions, this, that, and the other thing. And there's a few areas, you know, that we're um, working through uh, and, and we're really looking forward to your comments so that that'll help us, you know, improve this overall work product and, and get it to the next, next stage of development. Um, so we'll be going through each of these and I'll pause along the way, but do, do interrupt. If you have any questions, um, you know, raise your hand. Or, or, or whatever uh, method works for you um, on your end. Uh, so, Isabel, I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, and, you know, um, before I just go into these subsections in Section 33, um, I just wanted to go over sort of the structure of everything. Uh, you may recall we did publish two um, era frameworks that were just basically a, a, a reference of the policy as it existed and it's a, a, a straw proposal and draft final stages into sort of a tariff framework. And that, that was uh, intentional. It was sort of to kind of conceptualize how things would be re ultimately reflected in the ISO tariff. And so we followed that, and, and this is really based on the, the framework that we used for the EIM. So the context is similar, some of the uh, descriptions may be similar, some of the levels of details may be similar, but our main challenge, and it, and it continues, is to appropriately reflect the participation in the day ahead market and the real-time markets, and we'll get into this a little bit when we get to section 29, but to essentially allow for the seamless participation of an entity within both the day ahead and real-time markets, and also at the same time, we have you know full participants in the CAISO balancing authority area, and how uh, that that is all interrelated in a way that that is uh, workable and consistent. And we've done this in a number of different places in an effort to uh, be clear about all of that and also to um, uh, delineate different roles and responsibilities along the way. So for example, um, terminology, you know, even beyond the defined terms is really important in this, in this context. And I'll just highlight a few, but there are others so we have, uh, you know, a defined term of an EDAM entity. So, so when we say something like uh, an EDAM entity balancing authority area, we are being specific to EDAM entities and the operation of the day head market in their balancing area. When we when we use the term a balancing authority area in the EDAM area, that is used to mean the CAISO balancing authority area and the, all of the EDAM entity balancing authority areas. And this is just an example, and this is the same terminology and structure that we used in the EIM. And we kind of had a rule of reason, you know, if it worked in the EIM, uh, you know, it should hopefully work in the context of the EDAM. But again, like I said earlier, there's a little bit trickier here because we have the two markets and so in, in doing that, we've, we've tried to 
integrate that all, them all together. And we have a few new defined terms that we've created to, uh, to provide additional continuity between the market area in the day ahead timeframe. And as that expands out in, into the real time market, it would include all of the entities uh, in, in the, in the real time market. So um, with that, I, I just, just maybe just quick check, see if there's any really high level, broad, general questions or comments. And then what I'll do is I'll start to walk through the individual uh, sections of section 33 and, and beyond. But I thought, take a moment, let's see if anybody any has any really foundational, structural, or um, other comments here at the outset. All right, it looks like we have a hand from Kathleen. Hi, this is Kathleen Colbert from Vistra. Can you hear me? I can. Thanks, Kathleen. Awesome. Um, I just wanted to high level, and I know we'll submit comments and talk about all this in detail, but to kind of flag for you, it's interesting you bring up that one example of like the EDMBA or EIMBA versus ISO. Um, because it's one of the parts of the existing tariff that I've actually had a lot of challenges with. So there might be a few things that come up like that. Um, I think the main challenge that we've had with it is, is there's been a lot of confusion over whether ISO is even in the EIM, which sounds kind of silly for folks who are close to it, but the way the wording has, I think, been done just created some confusion. So we might want to think about that when we are thinking about the EDM tariff and maybe some conforming cleanups on the EIM side. I know we've been trying to do like the KISO EIM BAA versus non KISO EIM BAA, just to give you an example to try to make it clear when we're talking about how all the different areas participate within EIM versus if there's something really specific to KISO. Um, but yeah, I, thanks for bringing that one up, John, because it's kind of interesting. It actually has, I think, caused some confusion, at least on the external side. Yeah, that's that's a fair point, Kathleen. And I, I'm not going to admit that, that there's a structural flaw or anything in the in the EIM tariff or the extension of that to the EDAM tariff. And I, I think there might be one point I can make that might help. So it's to actually turn this whole thing around. So rather than thinking of, and in fact, this is how it's written in the in, in section 29 and in section 33, is the energy imbalance market and the extended day ahead markets are not separate markets. It's not the KISO is suddenly into a new market. It's everyone else is into the KISO real time market or the KISO day ahead market. And you'll see if you read through the tariff, the terminology extended day ahead market or EDAM is used as a modifier or an explanatory point. And we always try, and we may have some areas where we need to work on it, to refer to the operation and functioning of the markets as either the day ahead market or the real time market. In other words, Yes, there are differences when it's extended, and that's what the purpose of these sections in the tariff are designed to do in many ways. But for all real practical purposes, it's one real-time market and one day-ahead market, and it's not the EIM or the EDAM. It's the, the kind of day-ahead and, and real-time market. So that's, that's an idea. All right, enough about that. Um, any other questions at this point in time before we go into the subsection. Yes, we do have another question from Bonnie Blair. Bonnie, your line has been unmuted.
Bonnie, please check to make mm -hmm. sure you are not double muted on your end. Or, or Bonnie, if we can't hear you, you might want to put the um, request in chat. It looks like we can see the chat. All right. Well, Bonnie, um, we would love to hear from you. So uh, we can always circle back, you know, to your question anytime. Um, and any other questions at this time in the queue? Not seeing any hands. Um, Silas, do we have any questions on the phone only line? There are no questions on the phone line at this time. Okay. All right. All right, so now um, we'll get into section 33 and we'll go through sort of each of the subsections and sort of their intention and purposes and what they're designed to cover. Don't have all of the subsections here. Uh, many of the subsections, well, some of the subsections are not used and some other subsections are actually um, just simple cross-references uh, or, or, or exceptions or exclusions and, and we, we won't get into every single one, but we're covering everything um, above that line there and we'll start with section 33.1 and so this this is really the beginning, so this is sort of the foundation, and this this is the the, the basis and and possibly I suppose the genesis of the whole governance discussion around the applies to test. And I don't want to necessarily bring up governance here, but it, it it's mirrored uh, exactly as it is in the case of the energy imbalance market. So essentially, what Section 33.1 does in general, it does and describe what provisions of the ISO tariff apply um, to EDAM market participants. And it goes through uh, 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 some order of precedence language that also covers uh, what happens if there's an inconsistency between a provision of the uh, uh, section 33 and the rest of the tariff. And it has some special considerations for inconsistencies between Section 33 and Section 29, because um, unlike when we had Section 29, where we just had the potential for an inconsistency between those provisions and the rest of the tariff, here we have to have uh, consistency between the day ahead and real time participation of, of you know, balancing authorities other than outside of the CAISO balancing authority area. So that's in Section 33.1. In addition, uh, to, to that uh, high level language, we have um, included in the individual subsections some discussion about whether the corollary section of the ISO tariff uh, applies in, in full, in part, or, or not at all. Um, and, and that's also uh, rooted back in terms of the applies to test that's sort of set forth here at, at the highest level. And all of this structure, it, it, it mirrors the EIM tariff, uh, except like I said here, we have that additional complexity of uh, potential inconsistencies between participating in the day ahead market and the real time market uh, for balancing areas outside the ISO. Um, then the second uh, uh, section or portion of this Section 33.1, it, it covers um, uh, this sort of protectionist measure for the first 60 days of operation after the implementation of a new entity. Um, if, if things are really going bad, uh, they can suspend the operation of the market in the balancing authority area, uh, seek to resolve the issue and then reinstate the market. Or if it's incapable of resolution, it could be um, could be a permanent, uh, uh, you know, structural flaw. This this provision has never been implemented in the EIM, um, and we we would hope it wouldn't need to be implemented in the EDAM. But you know, it's there for 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 protection and assurance. And I'll, I'll make a note here as we continue through 
um, our sort of business requirements review and development of the business requirements specifications, all of that. Um, we are uh, attempting to do some reconciliation and make sure that uh, the draft tariff reflects, um, you know, what would actually um, occur in, in, in these types of circumstances. And in this case, um, there may be some uh, need to make an adjustment to reflect that there are no base schedules if you're uh, in the EDAM and, and there's some carryover language in this section. Uh, so, you know, that's to, to let you know the ISO continues its review of its draft tariff as, as you all continue with your review. So, um, we appreciate uh, your patience with us and, and we'll bring it all back together again in the next version. Um, so, that's essentially section 31, section, uh, sorry, 33.1, 33.2. The next subsection is really about how do you join the extended day ahead market and, and, and what are the roles and responsibilities um, comes up in the next section, but here it's basically the execution of an implementation agreement. And then similar to the EIM, we have included a, a list of appropriate uh, readiness criteria and reporting requirements to um, you know, demonstrate the, the fulfillment of, of a series of, of requirements that will be reported on publicly on the website and supporting uh, sort of market simulation and parallel operations leading up to uh, confirmation of readiness prior to the implementation. Of the, of the entity into the data head market. So it's it's very similar to the energy imbalance market process. I will um, note that we are not proposing to include an informational filing with the commission. We're sort of doing everything short of that and the requirements are slightly different because of course these entities are already in the imbalance market so there's uh, you know, a lot of the things have been done already as far as connectivity, network model development, and many of the heavy lifting uh, requirements and obligations. But uh, otherwise, it's very much the same as in the energy imbalance market. I'll go one more section and then open it up for questions. The next section, 33.4, this section um, it really includes uh, a high-level statement, so it parallels Section 4 of the ISO tariff, including a high-level statement of the various roles and responsibilities of the, of the participants in the extended day ad market and what, what agreements are required uh, to be executed by the entity. And this isn't, you know, a, a comprehensive list of, of the roles and responsibilities of the entities. Those are covered, you know, in total throughout the, the tariff, um, but it, it's sort of a high level description of, of their roles and responsibilities. And in, in this context, we've, we've tried, I hope successfully, to simplify things a little bit by developing, and we can touch on this later when we get to the agreements in Appendix B, but rather than having existing uh, EIM participants sign an entirely new suite of agreements because they are in essence just um, adding to their participation, so it's not something new or different. It's, uh, it's really a seamless day ahead into real time uh, participation and role and responsibility. We're doing this through uh, uh, an execution of an addendum rather than a new agreement. So it would incorporate this section 33 and the participation in the extended day ahead market. On this point, I'll note this is a, a, a requirement and we'll have to work through it um, in the implementation process, but the tariff does include these requirements that there essentially needs to be a one-to-one -one relationship between the entity participating in the day ahead market and the real-time market. And, 
and this this will happen and there will be some reshuffling on the, the schedule one of the participating resource agreements because there will no longer be non-participating resources that will all be under uh, 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 they'll all be quote unquote participating in that extended day ahead market so those sort of details you'd work through within the implementation process but the the key is that there's a one-to-one -one relationship and this is fairly obvious why but it's because if you're moving from the day ahead and you're getting a set of, uh, of, of schedules associated with your resources and loads, those need to flow through and are going to be settled out the other side uh, in the real-time market and you need to have continuity between the scheduling coordinator IDs that represent the participants in, in those two uh, time frames. Um, I guess the last point I'll make here is there is a new concept, and I don't know if it's entirely new, but it's uh, it's the concept of an EDAM load serving entity, and and what this is is intended to cover would be if there are loads, say a, a municipal utility or an embedded uh, transmission dependent utility within. A, an EDAM balancing authority area that um, was authorized, you know, by the entity to serve the load, that they could represent the load um, and bid that in to the to the day ahead market, and then of course uh, receive the the settlements through through the through the um, real time market with respect to the excuse me load that they represent. So that's that's due, and going back to that one-to-one -one relationship I noted, in this case, if that um, load-serving entity doesn't have to be a sub-entity within an EIM balancing authority area, but if it were, you'd want to have the same one-to-one -one type of relationship between the load-serving entity in the day ahead and the sub-entity in the real time. But if there's not an associated sub-entity, this uh, load serving entity could could just cover both the day ahead and the real time you know settlements of that load uh, all right i think i think with that covered you know quite a bit we'll we'll open it up and see if there's any questions about this as a reminder you can raise your hand by selecting the raise hand icon located at the bottom of the screen All right, looks like we have a hand, a hand from Ken Donald. Just on that last point you were making about the one-to-one -one relationship, um, bidding and serving load is sort of a, I don't know, an oxymoron. They're like, we don't think about it that way in today's world in EIM with uh, the LA or um, anyone's uh, EIM entity. Are, are there, is it important whether the PRSC or the EESC represents the load and does the bidding? Or are both options available? So, yeah, so I, I would I would say under the normal circumstance, the, the EIM and, and, and future EDAM entity would represent the load, right? In the, in the real time market, the, the entity represents all of the load in the balancing authority area, unless there's this sub entity concept has been adopted. So the, the reason I ask is that I wonder if opening up bidding functionality to someone on basically on the transmission side uh, exposes other data that ought not to cross the, um, the boundary. So, yeah, I, I'd have to give that a little bit more thought, Ken. I, I, I guess our, our thinking was similar to, to how it works in the in the ISO's balancing area. We do have, you know, uh, community choice aggregators and and load serving entities um, that that represent load, and uh, and and we wanted to recognize that concept in the day ahead market. Um, 
for outside mm -hmm. of that. And I'm familiar with that being the way it works in other markets too, but it's just that <clears throat> um, typically EIMBAs are also the reliability entity and you know, have exposure to certain uh, operational things that maybe you ought not to have if you're going to put in a market bid. Yeah, I I think we can think about it. I, I'd be interested in any comments you, you, you may submit on that. I guess the, the one one requirement, which is similar to uh, the sub entity concept, is that this separate load serving entity has to be sort of authorized by the EDAM entity. So there would be, you know, they they would have to come to some understanding and agreement about that. Um, but you know, I I I, I it's, it's essentially the ISO load serving entity concept extended into the into the day I market for other balancing areas. I don't know. Is that helpful at all? Yeah, I understand where you're going, and I'll I'll uh, coordinate with the other Dillacast folks to send a consolidated set of comments. Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. Anyone else? Yeah, we did actually get a, a question in the chat, so let me read that out. Um, it's from Bonnie Blair from the Six Cities. Um, the question is in regards to the distinction between EIM and EDM entities. Um, so all EDM entities are also EIM entities, but not vice versa. Uh, does Kaiso intend to call EDM entities just EDM entities with the understanding that they're also EIM entities? Or does it intend to differentiate with based on the day ahead versus real time market? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've taken the the latter approach. So we have we have not consolidated their uh, naming, you know, convention uh, into a single say EDAM entity. Uh, we we call them in the day ahead. They're an EDAM entity in the real time. They're an EIM entity, um, and and we've taken some uh, uh, time and and thought in section 29 to describe some of the differences uh, because things happen in the day ahead time frame that that, that result in uh, you know uh, uh, market results and other things and and things happening that that are not present if you're just in the real time market so. We've done that. Um, we think this is the right way. Otherwise, it, it would get quite a bit more complicated. And, and also, uh, it's a voluntary market. So if an EDAM entity withdraws but stays in the in the real time market, um, you know, this way, uh, it, you know, I don't know, seems seamless and workable to us. But uh, we'd we'd appreciate any comments on that, Bonnie, if if you have any. Looks like we might have another question um, coming in, Isabella. Yeah, um, could you briefly discuss the onboarding fee in section 33.2.1? Um, is that the hourly fee for assistance in setting up participation or something else? So that that's the implementation fee. And so it's as it was described in the policy. So that's the hourly fee um, and it is essentially what happens is the ISO it makes an estimate and collects an upfront deposit. I think I think the paper suggested uh, on average a three hundred thousand dollar deposit for implementation costs. Of course, that would vary by utility or entity. And then the ISO would 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 track the time it spent working on the project to implement the entity and account for its actual costs against that deposit. And then, then that deposit would be refunded with interest if there was, uh, if, if that was not, if that was more than sufficient, if it was insufficient, then an additional, uh, I think in $25,000 increments or something like that would be 
invoice um, to cover the additional costs. Again, with a final accounting of all costs and, and interest and everything at the end. Thanks, John. Looks like we have another hand up on the phone. So let's go ahead and unmute Dan Williams. Hey, John, Dan Williams from the Energy Authority. I'm uh, the section 33.4. I know that the EIM 70 scheduling coordinator policy was completed a while back, but I don't believe it's actually been um, implemented after the uh, tariff language was approved. Um, when we get to doing the deep dive on this, can uh, we do a check-in on kind of the status of that and what it would take to um, bring that into the market with EDAM if, if there's a desire among entities to use that functionality? Yeah, sure. I, I, um, my, my understanding is we have not received um, a request for interest, you know, in that sub-entity scheduling coordinator. Uh, you know, sort of concept, you are correct, it is in the tariff, and that there is a sort of a, an estimated 18-month implementation process. So, you know, if, if and when we do receive a, a request for that, we would we would certainly work with the entity and the sub-entities and, and, uh, and, and, and do what we needed to do to, uh, to implement that functionality. Of course, if that occurs in the middle of all of the rest of this stuff, uh, that might present some unique challenges, but uh, be happy to talk further about that, Dan. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Silas, do we have any questions on the phone only line? There are no questions on the phone line at this time. Okay. Okay. So now we'll sort of shift gears a little bit. Um, Kind of from, you know, sort of participation and joining and, and that sort of a thing into a little bit about operation. Um, it starts with section uh, 33.6. This is really just the communication requirements. A lot of it cross references back to section six. And it's all about this is really the ISO's OASIS publication uh, and reporting uh, requirements. Um, in many cases, and and in, in some cases, it's uh, sort of the entity's responsibility to um, to meet certain technical requirements, and then what happens if there's a loss of communications, uh, and you know, particularly around some requirements around variable energy resources and hybrid resources. But uh, overall, um, it's mostly all about the Kaisos Oasis and and all of the information that that's reported, reported there. Um, go to the next slide, Isabella. So section 33.7, this really gets into the um, core operation of the market, covers both normal and emergency conditions, and then it provides for um, uh, market disruption. And, and, and in essence, what uh, sorry, what happens is this is is relates back to some of the provisions that the ISO uh, implements when it experiences a market disruption, and it it tries to take those provisions and incorporate the concept of a. Of a the separate balancing authority area and what the roles and responsibilities of the different uh, entities would be under those circumstances. And, excuse me, much of this is, um, is familiar to some um, from the energy imbalance market, and it, it covers things like, you know, uh, the uh, sort of the suspension of, of transfers, isolation of a balancing authority area, Continued operation of the of the real time market within the balancing authority area, um, and all of these kinds of things, and from those sort of more extreme measures to simple, um, you know, uh, what prices do you reference if if there is a failure of the market, and and those kinds of things. So that's covered in this section 33.7. 
and um, there is also um, some provision about uh, the modeling of EDAM transfers, and more importantly, perhaps, is the this is the section that that establishes the transfer priority for EDAM transfers, and this was you know in the policy uh, received a lot of discussion, but essentially, this is the provision um, that establishes a, a priority equal to demand within a within a balancing area. And then it requires the, the operational coordination and communication for any curtailments of EDAM transfers um, that are necessary in order to maintain reliability within a balancing authority area. And, and, and so that's what, the reason that's all here is because this is about operation in the market under normal and emergency conditions. So um, it's there. I um, you know, appreciate your comments on that or anything else. Um, around section 33.7. And then 33.9, uh, it's the provisions essentially for outage reporting and uh, same as in the EIM, the outages are simply uh, uploaded and reported to the ISO. We don't, we don't review the outages or approve of the outages. That's the responsibility of the balancing authority. And um, that's then factored into the, the solutions in the market. Um, similarly, straightforward and parallel to the EIM is the metering requirements. We, we debated a little bit here whether or not to have a separate metering requirement for the extended day ahead market. It's more or less the same, but we went ahead and included it here just for purposes of, of clarity and consistency. Um, but we're open to anyone's comments on, on that. And, and with those sort of operational sections covered, I'll uh, go ahead one more time and open it up for questions. And uh, you can see I've got a little bit of a, I don't know if it's an allergy or whatever, but I'll uh, take the opportunity to clear my throat. Silas, are you seeing any hands on the phone line? No, there are no hands up at this time. Okay, I'm not seeing any in the chat or um, any hands raised. All right. Well, we'll keep going. Um, so, section 33. Oh, looks like Alva popped in. I don't know. Alva. No, let's go ahead and unmute Alva. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, a little bit light, but I can hear you. Okay, I'll try to get it. I, I'm just curious about this, um, about the, and, and actually, I'm sure this has actually already been worked out in the EIM, but the, as you just sort of described uh, the re requirements for outage reporting, it, it, it struck me that uh, essentially um, the CAISO market operator takes all outages from non-CAISO uh, out all non CAISO outages that are submitted by EDM BAAs are, are are taken without any review, uh, and that actually struck me as quite a quite a carte blanche. Is that has that ever been brought up as an as an issue versus what is done in reviewing outages within CAISO? And I'm I'm sure this is beyond the scope, but I just wanted was just curious whether briefly about that question. Yeah, I know it's a good question, and and it I don't know that it's come up since we thought it through in terms of the real time market, but um, you know we view the outage reporting and uh, and evaluation and approvals and all of that for for transmission and for generation as a reliability function. So because <clears throat> we're extending only the market, the reliability function stays with the uh, the balancing authority. Transmission operator, et cetera, and so um, we, we we do not extend our review of that. Certainly, um, you know, market monitoring and that kind of a thing would apply to uh, this, this this these circumstances if if there were uh, some sort of identified issue. I, I'm not aware 
Um, maybe somebody is, but I, I personally am not aware of an issue that's come up in the in the real time market so far uh, around this. But you know, I appreciate that. And, and the day ahead is a big, bigger, bigger deal, obviously, in many ways. Right. So, yeah. Right. I mean, the thing is that in some cases, the clearances are uh, ha uh, you know, they 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 provide a a, a lot of uh, uh, capability to influence the market. And sometimes, and there's also sort of gray areas in terms of whether a particular clearance is strictly a, a um, you know, kind of a, a minimal representation of something versus, a, you know, more a way of of uh, of addressing some some operational issues in a, in a convenient way. It just seems like some of that may get um, lost in the in 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 this. I'm not saying that, you, that obviously it can't be any different, but it, was, it just made me realize that there may be some differences in the way outages coming from uh, EDAM entities get processed in the market processes. So, thank you. Right, right. Yeah, no, we, we, we appreciate that. And, you know, <clears throat> this is, uh, you know, how, how, it, how it works. And I think you acknowledge that, Alva, in terms of extending a market. And, not, not you know, a, not a full participation ISO RTL model. So right. here we are. I, I see some other questions coming up. Yeah, let's take Ken, Ken Donald's question. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to build on the last comment that I think there are some um, suboptimal results of outages and. Uh, and not being coordinated with base schedules and EIM. Um, <clears throat> currently, I think that there is uh, no nothing that rejects a base schedule for a generator that's on outage or a base schedule that exceeds a D rate for that generator. Um, and I, I believe, I might have it backwards, but there, in one case, the, ba the base schedule is not used, I think, in settlement of the the resource, but then it is used in, in determining what the load based schedule is. Um, in either case, I think those, the, the consequences of that are isolated to the EIMBA because it's not monetized. The base schedule isn't, but it would, I think, uh, transcend e, EDAM BA borders in the day ahead market. If a resource was allowed to clear when it was, uh, on outage. Yeah, I, I can I, I that may be something worth uh, further consideration um, and reflection. I think, I think it's, you know, we're just going to have to pay attention to these things. Um, I mean, unless anyone on the ISO team wants to weigh in on that, um, we can move on to Kathleen. Uh, but I appreciate that, Kim. Uh, two questions. My first one is, I apologize if this, if this is a repeat, but the outage reporting, um, I assume that includes both generation and transmission outages, or Correct. can you clarify that, John? Okay, that's great. Yeah, um, yeah the ISO does not review the, the transmission outages. I think there's some, there's some requirements for uh, contingencies or, um, anyway, constraints and this and that. I, I don't have it all in my head right now, but go ahead. Yeah, no, this is interesting. And um, one of the things that is coming uh, to my mind that I have no, uh, I honestly, if we could do, add this to the list of things to do a deep dive on would be helpful is, you know, how we have this concept that there are certain transmission outages that are, have significant impacts on the CRR market. And so there's some deadlines for, you know, doing kind of best effort, well, for submitting those outages like 30 days prior to the first of the month. Um, it's in section 36. Um, so anyway, as we're talking through this, it, I'm just, it would be helpful to close the loop or have a discussion to help close the loop on whether or not any of the trans, any other transmission outages outside of the KISO control grid would be considered one of these CRR like still impacting the CRR results, even if CRRs aren't in the other areas, they might 
have a significant impact. Um, I don't believe we've discussed this, so if you could flag it, that would be helpful. Okay. Hey, John, that sounds that sounds like a similar issue to something that I think David is dealing with. So I think we can definitely take that back. Yeah, I, I would agree, uh, Heather, and thanks, Kathleen. I I think if if and when we do get to CRRs in the extended dad market, um, you know, that certainly would, would, would need to be reconciled. But we'll look into it in any event here. Um, any Anyone else at this time? I'll just... Go into section 11 a little bit and then we'll keep going. Not seeing any additional questions at this time. Okay. So, um, oh boy, section 33.11. All right. So, there's a lot here. This is um, one of the two probably most expensive sections, uh, not surprisingly, in section 33. Um, covers uh, uh, everything. We were aware of in terms of the settlement. Um, you know, you've got uh, transfer and congestion revenue settlement, uh, and and there is some parallel provision in Section 11 uh, of the ISO tariff, and we'll get to that when we get to Section 11. But you've also got all of the resource efficiency evaluation, failure surcharge accounting, um, got market settlements, just general. Um, including some offsets and cross-referencing back to Section 11. Like I said, we'll get into that. And then you've got, last but not least, implementation and administrative charges. And I'll, I'll take a moment here. This is this is one area where we, yeah, so I, we think that everything's reflected here, but we're still reconciling um, the provisions in terms of uh, do they belong in section 11 uh, or do they belong in section 33.11? And I say this, so so in the EIM, we kind of took the principled approach that if the settlement provision allocates costs between balancing authority areas, then the, the entire provision would be in section 11. And then, and then for, for Settlements or pricing and all of that within BAA, that could be in section 33.11, in case of EIM 29.11, and reference over to section 11 in terms of you know how do you calculate imbalanced energy, how do you calculate uninstructed imbalanced energy, those kinds of things. So we're trying to take a similar approach in section 33. We think we still have a little bit of work to do um, about that and. Uh, uh, transfer revenue allocation is a good one, um, but w w we're going to continue to think about that and work on that. But um, the, the main point is that we have included um, uh, everything we could uh, we could identify in terms of uh, a, a specific um, settlement uh, requirement or allocation or calculation in terms of of, of, of the EDAM both in this section 33.11 and then, like I said, when we get to section 11. So, um, Isabel, you want to go to the next slide? I can't really remember where we go from here. There's more. Okay, we're going to jump into transmission. So, um, let's take a pause and see if there's anything on settlement. I see Doug both Joni and up. Looks like Doug. Doug Bochignone for the city and county of San Francisco. In the uh, section 11 or 33.11.1, at the, towards the end, it refers to the transfer revenues being allocated uh, to the CAISO BAA uh, TOR holders pursuant to the terms of an agreement. Are, are you anticipating that that will be like, like the, um, whatever, what do we call that agreement? Oper operations agreement uh, between the ISO yeah. and the TRR holders? Yeah, just Doug, that is correct. And just for everyone's understanding, in, in the CAISO balancing authority area for, for uh, transmission ownership rights at 
at Intertize, um, we have a operating agreement with the, the transmission owner that governs like sort of the scheduling and all of that with respect to that. So we were thinking um, that if there was any specific adjustments or cost allocation issues covered in any of those agreements, that, that that's what this was intended to capture. And yeah, because what, what I'm a little con uh, confused about is, you know, there's sort of language in the, for trans the EDAM transmission ownership rights it's a little more clear about what's intended to happen and you know in terms of sharing of revenues and whatever whereas here it seems to be a little bit more open-ended um, and and i'll just note that 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 language is in the section about the energy transfer revenues but there isn't corresponding language about the um, uh, imbalance reserve transfer revenues and the reliability capacity transfer revenues seems like it would need to be in in all those sections. Yeah, so two points. So the first one, yeah, definitely flag that for us in your comments if if you have a a, a concern or or want to articulate anything about that. On the second, it's my understanding at least that the um, the transfer revenues um, in terms of what's allocated, it was energy transfer revenues were allocated to the to the transmission ownership rights holder in this case, um, not the imbalance reserve or the reliability capacity revenues. So in other words, what you're identifying was, I guess, by design in, in the drafting, not not just an ambiguity or, or, or issue with that. It, and I'll have to defer to others to speak to that if, if, if that causes you concern, Doug. Yeah, I, I thought maybe I can articulate my concern. I, I, I guess I hadn't uh, uh, understood it that way or hadn't picked up on that nuance. Um, and it, it seems like the capacity, you know, it's being, all those products are being co-optimized and they're all would be using the same transmission. So if there's, you know, if, if the capacity, some of the capacity is used for these other capacity like products instead of for transferring energy, that's, you know, is the source of value that have been captured. Thanks. Yeah, so we'll we'll take take that back. Please do put that in your comments, but um, I'll circle back with folks here and just make a note of that here. So. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're. Uh, moving along into transmission availability, we're uh, two o'clock. Okay, we're doing all right. And on these sections, so I, I kind of lumped them all together, at least in this slide, and we've laid it out. Uh, we think sensibly, but you know, we we definitely look for any any comments you have. So we kind of broken it down into the three main uh, flavors of transmission that could be made available uh, for transfers. So the, the first two would be what we've called EDAM legacy contracts. So these are sort of the, the traditional pre-OAT or otherwise non-OAT arrangements uh, between the transmission service provider and the, and the, and the other, other third party. And then through sort of third party ownership rights, in, in terms of you know third party owning rights and and um, in 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 a BAA other than the ISO for the ISO we're going to just treat all of those things uh, other than the transfer revenues and that kind of thing we've been just talking about a little bit um, in accordance with you know the existing provisions of the ISO tariff so nothing new there but we're going to incorporate um, those provisions of the tariff 
in terms of the treatment of these legacy contracts and ownership rights. So that's kind of the uh, accounting uh, of all of that. Um, and in addition, there's some registration procedures and all of that, and, and we go into a little bit about that in section 33.16 and 33.17 for those, those two, two types of arrangements. And then um, we shift into uh, sort of oat transmission, and and this is this is where you know we get into all the sort of the buckets and pathways and internal and external inner ties and all of that. So we've tried to break it down so that um, the first distinction is between external inner ties. So these are inner ties between an EDAM balancing authority area and either uh, an external balancing authority area that's not in the energy imbalance market or even uh, an entity that's in the energy imbalance market. And so in the day ahead time frame, you know, we have to recognize those external inner ties as such. And we've accounted for that um, through these procedures or sort of the, you know, how, what, 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 what transmission qualifies at these locations, how do you register it, how do they schedule it, and then what happens with late, late schedules. And all of that's sort of in, in 38.3.18.1. And then those, those transmission or inner ties, they do not support transfers, right? So those are not transfer locations. These are for like imports, exports, and wheel throughs and EDAM balancing authority area. And then we shift to uh, transmission of internal air ties. And this is where we, you know, in the in the policy paper, it went through the buckets and pathways and all of that. And we, we, we don't have that in the tariff, but we do have it broken down and it tracks with what was in the policy. Um, and that's in section 33.18.2. So once again, um, we have you know, three main subsections for the three uh, three buckets, what we would call buckets, and then within uh, the second section, uh, uh, which was called bucket two, we we have the the three different pathways articulated there in further subsections. So all of that is in this 33.18. So obviously an important section of the tariff. This is sort of uh, new, if you will, and, and different from the, the uh, energy imbalance market. So we have that, and we have the different uh, scheduling requirements and what happens if you submit a late schedule or no schedule at all, um, what happens to available transfer capability, and all of that stuff is in, is in this section. And then the final <clears throat> section in transmission here in section 3318, we have uh, covered for ISO uh, availability. So we have the ISO transmission availability, has the ISO make transmission available at, at, uh, at EDAM inner ties, and it, and it goes through a description of, uh, you know, the, the similar concepts in terms of exports and wheeling and available transfer capability on the ISO controlled grid and how that's made available for, for transfers. And then there's a cross-reference back, probably a little bit belt and suspenders, but we go back to section 33 with a reference to the EDF transfer priorities equal to demand, just so that there was no confusion there, but it's not covered in like here. Um, and, and those three sections, are the majority of the transmission availability. I'll make one more note, and that's in addition going back to um, section 33.7 under sort of the normal and emergency operations, if you remember, there's also provision in there about how we model these uh, sort of uh, transfers in, in, in the market. So that is some important information there as well. But with that, well, let's look on uh, who's got questions about transfer availability. 
like Doug's got his hand back up. Yeah, let's go ahead and unmute Doug. Thanks, John. Um, so in this 33.18.3, it looks to me like that's sort of the, the foundational section that links or just describes how the TORs within the ISO will be treated similarly to to those in the EDAM entity areas. Um, right. Is that, is that right? Okay. And yep. the, the thing that I'm a little um, unclear about, though, is in, in those sections, 33.16.2 and 17.2, it talks about rights across interties. And I think in at least in some cases, I'm aware of may, maybe in most at the ISO inner ties, I don't think the rights typically go across the inner tie. They're sort of to the inner tie. And so I'm thinking that that language maybe needs to, in this section 16 and 2 and 17, 2 need to address that possibility. And I would think this wouldn't just be unique to the ISO, I think in, across other EDAM entities, you may have circumstances where the rights don't go all the way across. Right, and so there is, way this, you know, definitely put that in your comments. I think we, we, we probably want to think about this because a, a, a transfer you know, sort of by definition is is across an inner tie, takes takes two to tango. Um, we've we've said that in in the other sections. Um, but, you know, I hope that's appropriate and consistent with the policy for the ISO. This this relates back in some ways to your other comment, um, which was about the agreements. So in in terms of the ISO control grid. And having uh, uh, transfer or transmission ownership rights, you know, from from uh, only on one side of an inner tie, so to speak, and whether those rights uh, uh, should receive uh, the transfer revenues. We're not debating, you know, that here, but we we wanted to kind of tie that all together a little bit, and that was what we're trying to do here at a sort of high enough level, uh, but. You know, we're open to your comments, so appreciate that, Doug. Thanks, John. We do have a general timeline question in the chat. I'm just asking when the ISO plans to develop the BPM for EDAM. So our normal practice for the business practice manual publication is to generally develop it as part of the implementation of the project. So it would be tariff and business requirements, software development, and then the BPM with publication prior to the implementation. So with the EDAM, we are considering, but we have not committed to um, whether there's an opportunity to move some of that development forward uh, in time, you know, potentially as early as um, you know, the, the filing uh, time frame that would be the absolute earliest in an effort to sort of bring, bring some uh, additional understanding to some of the references in the tariff to the business practice manuals or um, other, other materials uh, that, that may be appropriate or necessary for, you know, stakeholders to, to actually um, you know, have full and meaningful understanding of the filing and the tariff as it pertains to all of that. But I I am not the one to commit the organization to that, and I'm just letting you know what we're thinking. So if you have strong uh, interest in that, please let us know. Um, I hope that answers that question. All right, do we have any other questions on the phone only line? No questions on the phone line at this time. Okay. All right, Isabella, yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, 
continuing a little bit with transmission theme, we're going to move on. Um, so this section 33.23, this this is the ISO um, transmission service uh, section. So this is where we included the the EDAM transmission service requirements. In other words, these are the requirements within uh, an EDAM balancing authority area for transmission service in order to participate uh, in, in the market. And, and this is to reflect the policy that we wanted or everyone, there was consensus to have a standardized approach on this and the duration of what the requirements were and how they would, uh, they didn't have a reservation, what they would, what they would have to pay and all that sort of stuff. So that's here. And then in, uh, in section 33.26, this is the ISO's um, provision for transmission service on the ISO grid and the rates and charges for that service. And uh, this is where we've included the, the transmission revenue recovery mechanism, uh, you know, the different components of that from the access charge and how that's developed for the what's what's recoverable revenue and how that revenue is then allocated out and you know some obviously there were some discussions around you know uh, what what qualifies uh, say if it's a new uh, facility increases transfer capability those kinds of things um, it's all in the section 33.26 at, at at a tariff level so relatively high level, but uh, we've covered it, you know, fairly completely, we think, in this section. So another uh, important section um, in terms of transmission, this is the uh, recoverable revenue uh, provision. I will, I think, let me see. Yeah, let's open it up for questions. See if anybody's got any question on this transmission services and revenue uh, recovery mechanisms from the tariff, and then we'll go into something a little bit different with uh, sort of modeling and bidding. As a reminder, you can raise your hand by selecting the raise hand icon located at the bottom of your screen. All right, I'm not seeing any hands oh. or questions in the chat. Oh, here we go. One question from Don Trethaway. Let's go ahead and unmute Don. Hi, John. Hey, Don. Hey, are the the transmission costs associated with uh, Section 33.23 included in the default energy bid section? Um, given that there's a potential cost for certain resources? Um, so well, let's let's think this through. I I'm not actually entirely sure. I don't think it's specifically called out in the default energy bid uh, determinations. Um, but this would be a, a rate that would be charged and collected under the OAT. So it's not an ISO transmission service. It's just trying to standardize this for everyone. What do you need? To participate in the EDAM, so kind of that requirement, and then and then I, I I'm not familiar with how transmission costs are included within the default energy bids for um, other resources, or if they're not at all considered. Maybe maybe David or anyone else. I don't know who's on our side here can help with that. Um, so, yeah, this is David. I think, can, can I just restate what I, is the question, and I don't think I know the answer if I understood the question right, but it was it whether the cost of transmission will be embedded within default energy bids? Yeah, this is Don. So, no, the, the, so the, there's a, you know, the hourly transmission charge to the extent that you don't have network service and all of that, that you're then charged that cost. Uh, by the EIM entity or the EDAM entity, 
the, the question is, is that cost going to be included as sort of a standard line item in the default energy bid for that resource? Oh, I see. As in, that's the cost you incur, so you should be entitled to recover it as part of the default energy bid. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, at least I understand the question. I don't. I don't have the answer. I think I don't know that we addressed that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I hadn't thought about that before. So we'll we'll take that back. I suppose. Thanks. Yeah, Don. Yeah, thanks. And I, I, I'm pretty sure it's not specifically covered, like David said. So we'll take that back, put it in your comments, and and we'll keep going. All right. Uh, so now uh, we'll shift gears again a little bit and uh, cover uh, a few sections around sort of modeling and bidding, and now we're getting a little bit into more uh, of the market uh, and the, the processes uh, around that. And so the first section, 33.27, this this includes, um, so in, in the ISO tariff for the ISO controlled grid, includes a, a lot of uh, uh, material around, you know, constraints and, and, and enforcement of constraints, priorities, and this, that, and the other thing. In the market, so in terms of the extended day ahead market, um, we do have that transitional protective measure in that we, we we call it shorthand the price discovery mechanism. So essentially, or you can call it the the last economic bid and for the first six months of operation, basically, rather than a uh, 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 the price being set by a potential parameter price, it, it's the last economic uh, bid that sets the market clearing price. So it discovers that price, and that becomes the price for that BAA for those six months, uh, and that's what that transitional measure does. Um, and then we have, uh, in, in the ISO tariff, and we'll get to this when we get to section 27, this is the section of the tariff that covers the price formation, um, and in, in, in this case, references Appendix C, and we'll get to that as well. Um, but it taught, we've included some of that here about uh, the, the, the price formation, and mostly just cross-referencing Appendix C. Um, and also, uh, here we have uh, this concept of resource aggregation that uh, you know, scheduling points outside or pinos outside of the of the market area um, would be aggregated into these default generation points, um, and uh, and that's covered in more detail in Appendix B. So we'll we'll get to that as well. And then uh, um, we also have here this power balance constraints um, relaxation. Uh, concept. So this was the uh, the constraint that makes sure that the entities are able to meet their BAA requirements before supporting uh, transfers uh, outside of the BAA. So this is not the net export constraint. This is a sort of a foundational market constraint um, that 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 does this. So the net export constraint. Is something separate, and we'll we'll get to that in section a couple of sections from now. Um, last, uh, we we did include a an exception for uh, balancing authorities that are um, what we call integrated the IBAA integrated balancing authority area. So these were embedded balancing areas within the CAISO balancing area, and there was certain requirements. Uh, uh, associated with that, um, parallel flows, this, that, and the other thing. Anyways, uh, w once those utilities or entities or balancing authorities are in the day ahead market, there's no longer a need to en enforce these requirements, so they're uh, exempt from them uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the their balancing area. And so those those rules would no longer apply. They're still in effect if uh, if they reverted back to the energy imbalance market only, 
or all the way back uh, to um, outside of the peso market. They would they would bring back into effect. Um, all right. We'll keep going. Uh, the next section, 33.30. So this is sort of the bidding and scheduling rules, and uh, most of most of these provisions will be as is in section 30, and they're all incorporated by reference. But there are some unique uh, provisions that we have uh, reflected here in terms of balancing areas outside the ISO and entities and the submission of bids, self-schedules, and demand bids. And perhaps um, more importantly, uh, this is, has the limitation on economic bids at external inner ties, as was described in the paper. It also includes the convergence bidding rules. Um, in other words, uh, the two year, um, I think it's two years, it went back and forth. I sort of lost track, but I think it's two years. <laughs> the two year uh, 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 option, if you will, uh, not to enable convergence bidding within a balancing area. Uh, so there's some rules around that. And then um, again, we get into uh, more about external uh, resources. So if you'll recall from the policy, there was a lot of discussion around participation or counting of external supply resources in the resource efficiency evaluation. And so this is the section that covers the different rules and requirements about those delivered firm energy contracts and uh, you know pseudo ties or dynamic schedules and all of that is here in section 33.30. Um, finally, we have a provision that says that the day ahead schedules are what count in terms of the uh, EDAM entities transition to the real time, so they no longer would submit of a schedule. It would be the day ahead schedules would, would become, in essence, what was previously a base schedule or base load schedule in the real-time market. <clears throat> and I think I'll check for questions and then we'll go into, um, yeah, let's check for questions and then we'll go into the, the extended dead market, the, the long, you know, whatever, section 33.31. All right, oh, Alva. Question about convergence bidding. So currently, and I don't know how exactly how this is specified in in the tariff, but currently the CAISO has the ability to define locations where convergence bidding is is not um, going to be permitted versus locations where it is going to be permitted. And I, I think among those are um, maybe tie points, or at least it has been in the past. I don't know what the current those are. Uh, I was curious as to how that is specified here. In other words, even if a, 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 B, a BAA could theoretically be uh, bound to provide convergence bidding, could they just simply say no convert, none of the points within their balancing area uh, would allow convergence bidding? Or is there some, uh, um, some definition given around that in this uh, uh, Finding the report that, there, that there's going to be a requirement for this after after two years. Sure. So my understanding, and um, I'll look to Bill Weaver if there's any follow up questions, is that the the external inner tie convergence bidding limitations would 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 continue um, in the other balancing areas in the in the EDAM. But I, I I don't believe, and it, I think it would be problematic if 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 an entity could just say no convergence bidding at any of these points, internal and external, and thereby by somehow you know circumvent the the requirement and essentially nullify uh, the convergence bidding for for you know beyond the the two year period. Um, so your your sense the only exception would be at actual 
interfaces to external um, balancing areas. I, I think that's correct. Yeah, not not internal EDAM inner ties, just external inner ties. Bill, um, if you have more to add, that'd be great. No, but um, you know, Alan, if you want to submit that comments, we'll we'll take it back and and definitely uh, come up with a, a firm answer. Yeah, great. Thanks. And, and, and it occurred to me that there's also even even if in general you allow convergence bidding, I know there have been times when the CAISO has suspended convergence bidding and perhaps the the controls around that, whether that is entirely done by the market operator or whether that's a BAA function would also be useful to address there. Yeah, and I think I think there we've said that it is, it is still the, um, the market operator's call. We certainly take the input from the EDM entities that would be requesting that, but um, it's a, um, you know, it, it's a rare and extraordinary step that uh, you know, we usually take almost at a, at a system level or pretty aberrant um, market circumstances, but uh, we'll, we'll have to think about that as, as we go forward. But, but currently it is the market operator's decision with input from the EDM entities. Okay, great. Those both sound like pretty, pretty bright lines. So thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I think I think we can move on now to the next slide, Isabella. Okay, so uh, section thirty three dot thirty one. So this is this is really um, you know all about the extended day ahead market operation and includes quite a bit of material, uh, and so. It, it will include things like the resource efficiency evaluation, the timing and the components and the performance and passage and failure and pooling and surcharge calculations. Oh boy, there's there's a there's a lot of a lot of stuff here for the resource efficiency evaluation as you can appreciate given the extensive discussions that were had. Um, in the stakeholder process around around the, the RSE, and so hopefully we have uh, you know captured that here. And again, um, the the settlement provisions around this are back where we were in section 33.11, but the operation and you know the pooling and the passing and all of that, and the determinations around that are here. And and we'll get to the RSE in the real time when we get to section 29, that and the next topic, greenhouse gas accounting, are the two main uh, changes, if you will, to the, to the, to the real-time market rules in section 29, because uh, that is a, or excuse me, those, those provisions actually change in the extended day ahead market or when we implemented or adopted this policy, the proposal was to change how those work in real time, and so that's reflected there. We'll get to that. But for for terms of uh, the extended uh, ad market, we have the RSC. Then we go into uh, all after all of that, we get into the essentially the operation of the day ahead market in the EDAM area, and the sort of not a lot of difference here. Uh, just narrated uh, to make sure it's all tied together, sort of the uh, uh, MPM, IFM, and RUC, and uh, all of that in the EDAM area. And then it goes into uh, uh, another topic of extensive discussions, the net export transfer constraint and that formulation for that. So we have translated the formulation into a narrative so that that should be reflected here and then you know the enabling of that constraint and the timelines and the procedures around all of that um, but this is the place where we have referenced the business practice manual so the constraint the formulation of the constraint itself would be here but the enforcement uh, or the decision or determination and the timing and the mechanics of how a balancing area would go about that 
but we're deferring at this time to the business practice manual. Um, then we get into, I guess, another important area uh, certainly is the forecast, forecasting for the balancing areas, and then the treatment of, uh, of demand response programs in, in terms of load modification, how that's accounted for in the forecast. And, uh, and we finish it up with some points around reserve sharing and interchange schedules generally and how the market would account for those. And uh, I think I'll, I'll go to questions and then we'll get, get to GHG, but we'll just check in and see if there's anything around any of that in 33.31. While we're waiting to see if anyone raises their hand, do we have any questions on the phone only line? No questions on the phone only line at this time. Okay, I'm not seeing any uh, questions in the chat. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, and uh, you can always go back if we need to, but the greenhouse gas provisions are here in section 33.32 and you know, <clears throat> similar to the resource efficiency or other uh, proposals, uh, we've reflected the policy um, as it was in the final paper in in the draft tariff uh, sections here. And uh, <clears throat> this is an area, as well as the resource efficiency I'll mention, and we'll get to it next, I think, but Appendix A, there's some new defined terms that are going to be used in, in different places related to GHG or DRSE, and those those can sometimes be important to review in parallel with the these So the GHG, uh, you know, it covers the, the, the differences in the new provisions in terms of the, the bid adders, market clearing, enforcing constraints, and the availability of data and information. Uh, a lot in there, uh, you know, this is not the call to go over all of that. Um, but uh, we will look for comments on this, and I, um, I will look to any questions on GHG if we can, and then we have, oh, no, we don't have Sarah. We'll have to call back to Andrew if there's any questions. Ken? But I, with the timing, I'm not sure there's going to be a lot left by the time we get there. But it, it seems like the wording in section 29 is not correct around resources that are in California, but not in CAISO. So I'm, I'm thinking of my friends at LADWP. And I, it seems to me that there are uh, several places in section 29 where the term CAISO balancing authority area is used when it should instead be the California GHG regulation area. Okay. So if I could just kind of put a pin in that for when we do get to it. Yep, yep, you're welcome. And um, do um, follow up with a comment and I see Andrew is unmuting. So see if Andrew has any follow up. Yeah, we, we, this is Andrew Omer. Hi, we will definitely go back and review that. Um, it is a little, a bit of a, uh, and you have to, you have to go through the logic game because you have, yeah, resources within the state of California that are within potentially EDAM balancing authority areas and obviously resources within the state of California that are within the California ISO's balancing authority area and, you know, mapping, um, attributions now to greenhouse gas zones, um, which is a, a different modeling feature than, than the balancing authority area. So we'll um, we'll go back though and take that comment. Make sure we scour the language again. Okay, Sarah, maybe we'll turn to you. At the discovery first board meeting where this was, uh, the, the concept was approved, 
there was something said about the need to do additional work on the greenhouse gas issues. And I think Mark, Mark Rothleder sort of said that, that the Kaiser was committed to doing additional work there. Can you speak to that at all? Um, I, I, I can't personally, uh, but maybe Andrew can. Um, yeah, I, I think that what we're doing here, of course, as John said, is capturing what um, was in the final policy in terms of a market design for GHG accounting. Um, that, of course, doesn't foreclose um, ongoing discussions um, with stakeholders uh, in our markets, with, with state authorities, um, et cetera, on features of greenhouse gas accounting uh, that, that could be incorporated into our market design. And uh, as we look into the future, I would expect you know, those conversations to, to continue and um, you know, for the ISO to, to engage those conversations in, in an open manner, trying to figure out if there, there are refinements that, that we could pursue. I don't have a you know, specific um, schedule for when those conversations will start or when they'll be scoped out. Um, but I think it is something that we are looking to try to begin um, in the coming months. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. And I, I think this last section includes um, section 33. And, and there are, you know, a few miscellaneous important provisions here at the end. Um, including rules of conduct, applicability, and market monitoring, and that thing, sort of thing. But here we did want to highlight that we have um, applied the, uh, the the price correction authority, so extending the the the, the window within uh, which we could correct prices for six, the first six months of operations from five to ten business days. I think it's five, three, five. I get. It, there's different time frames for the real time and day ahead market in the CAISO, but here we're saying 10 business days for price corrections for the first six months. Okay. Um, I would move on, uh, Isabella, to the next slide. I think it's Appendix A now. Um, all right. So, uh, lots of new defined terms and amendments of existing terms. And all of that. So, just some thoughts to keep in mind when you're looking at these terms. So, similar to the EIM, we tried to use the modifier EDM in front of all of the all of the terms that are sort of unique to the extended day and market. So, EDM entity, um, that kind of a thing. And so, you'd have an EDM entity and an EIM entity, and and that would be the BAA that's in the market. Um, there are some general uh, new terms that apply to, to both the, the EDAM and the EIM. And when, when we have those, we didn't include a, a modifier. So I think diversity benefit is a good example because there's a diversity benefit in the RSE. And if we need to make the distinction, we can add EDAM or EIM and create a, you know, I think it was called a you know, combined term. Um, then we also uh, included uh, changes to existing EIM provisions in order to align some of those with EDAM. Most of them uh, remain unchanged, but there are a few. And then um, we've amended a, a number of terms uh, that were amended with the energy imbalance market uh, to be consistent with the the, um, the the day ahead market. So we've added. Um, you know, terminology mostly to account for uh, certain, you know, concepts within a balancing authority area outside of the ISO. Um, quite a bit there, um, and of course, my terms are important, but I'll open up any questions because can't go term by term, um, but we'll definitely look forward to call, uh, comments on these, you know, this terminology. All right, not seeing questions. All right, 
So now, all right, section 29. So there's a couple things going on in this section. I'd say, uh, well, let's not say first and foremost, but um, we have three three concepts. Basically, uh, the most straightforward are the changes to the GHG rule that were proposed as the part of the EDAM that are included in the real-time market. Um, and similarly, um, in section 29.34, you have the changes to the resource efficiency evaluation that were proposed as part of the EDAM. So these, you know, accounting for the diversity benefits of pooling and pooling of, of, of entities. Are you in the pool of the day ahead? Are you out of the pool of the day ahead? Um, when you're going into the real time and all of that. And then we've also um, included uh, changes to account for adjust for assistance energy transfers. And this, this becomes, you know, a bit complicated uh, when you're when you're in the in terms of the recently filed um, assistance energy transfer proposal and and the RSC and the day ahead and in the pool out of the pool anyway it's all there in section 29.34 and it should tie out with section 30 uh, 33.31 um, all right then I guess in this more conceptual and we have included in a number of locations and identified many of them here, sort of a high level uh, concepts about either differences or uh, relationships between uh, the, the day ahead market and the real time market. And this is all intended to align the participation of an entity within the day ahead and, and then the, uh, the real time as a result of the day ahead participation. So we had to account for you know, continuing participation of EIM entities and then the option for some to move ahead and, and participate in the day ahead. And like I noted earlier, there are some differences. Um, I guess most importantly, you get a bunch of base schedules, or sorry, day ahead schedules that replace your base schedules and load schedules, you get transfers, um, you get RSC results, you get all kinds of things happen in the day ahead time frame that are then going to set up slightly differently in the real time. So that's what these provisions are intended to do and also then you know, sort of account for that order of precedent type language and relationships between the different uh, uh, sections. All right. Um, All right, with that, I will open it up for questions on section 29. All right, it looks like we have a hand from Dan Williams. Hey, John, Dan Williams again from TEA. Um, this seems like as bad of a place as any to ask a question that I'm not sure where it should be asked at, um, but it has to do with kind of um, this scenario of having uh, EDAM entities next to uh, EIM only entities. Uh, so the, the scenario is you have uh, three balancing authority areas, just call them one, two, and three. Um, BA1 and BA3 are in EDAM, and BA1 has transmission rights through BA2 to BA3 um, that are used in EDAM. Um, when we get to EIM, um, how, what changes with the use of that um, transmission right? In EIM, now you'd have an ETSR between one and two and between two and three. Um, how does that get handled for the uh, transmission right that's brought to EDAM directly between one and three across two? Okay. So, if if there was a, a transfer, in other words, there was some opportunity to connect EA one and three in, in your scenario as a transfer, my understanding is that 
the difference is that that, that value or whatever resulted from the market in terms of the transfer that would be that would be uh, that would be tagged right as 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 a as a as an amount that was expected to you know flow in the real time um, and then that would that would that would be true so there'd be no real difference between adjacent BAAs and the e, EDAM transfer in terms of how that would work um, but. I, I, you know, it's not clear to me exactly what, if any, uh, arrangements with the intermediary BAA may be needed. I don't know if those are ownership rights all the way through or if it's transmission services. I think in the energy and balance market, there were some arrangements and uh, it, it ultimately led to, there was, uh, you know, recognition under open access tariffs about uh, the, these, these uh, real-time uses and uh, you know maybe maybe there's things we can do um, with intermediary BAAs and work things out. Um, but anyway, I think there's more to more to more to do there. I, I'll look to any other other ISO folks if they have any comments about the um, you know the, the, the your question. Yeah, and if you could just take it back as kind of a scenario to you know, mentally walk through. I know most of our policy development was about around kind of a contiguous market, but um, just thinking through kind of how that um, that uh, they had use of a, establishing a schedule across uh, or through a um, EIMBA using some firm rights that are able to be brought to the market, what happens from a congestion rent, cost allocation, and generally um, management in the, the real-time market for doing that real-time optimization that now includes all three BAs and uh, ATC methodology for the ETSRs between um, them in kind of a serial fashion. So. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a fair point, Dan, and, and you know, we do, we do appreciate the complexity that can come with all of that, but as you know, we at least demonstrated in the energy imbalance market. You know, there are solutions and ways that we can um, work through these. Hopefully, all of the entities you know involved are you know sort of willing to to do to make things work. You know, we have the reverse, and we've dealt with that in terms of the transmission. So you know, you're an external entity with transmission through the EDAM area. And you're wheeling through the EDAM, and how is that accounted for in terms of uh, your transmission? You know, as it goes through the uh, the EDAM area, uh, wheeling through. So yeah, all of these scenarios are possible. All right. Um, looks like Dan. Oh, it's just a follow-up note. Okay, let's um let's move on and keep keep going here, uh, unless anyone has any other questions. But we'll we'll keep going. Isabella? All right. Okay. So back to section 11 and settlement. So I guess we've um, accounted primarily uh, for changes in, in two areas that were uh, you know, part of the changes that were presented when we implemented the energy imbalance market. And like I noted earlier when we were on section 3311, uh, you know, we're we're going to continue to evaluate whether there's further provision uh, to be reflected in, in Section 11, and we have the principle that you know settlement provisions allocating costs among BAAs kind of are in Section 11. But the the, the reality is that it's not really that important where where they appear as long as they appear somewhere and are accurate, and we'll sort out where they where they best belong uh, uh, down the road. Um, so the first one, and this is a major change uh, from the EIM, and it's the separation of the transfer revenues from the congestion revenue and settlements associated with that. And so we have uh, made changes in Section 11.5.4 uh, to account for this separation of these two uh, now distinct revenue streams in the in the extended day ahead market. 
And of course, this uh, accounting will carry through to the real-time market, even for balancing authorities that are not participating in the EDM. You'll have a, a, a you know, congestion revenue settlement, but no EDM transfer revenue settlement and, and, and the like. All right, then uh, the second change is in section 11.8, and this is uh, to account for GHG bid cost recovery and uh, just bid cost recovery changes in general. And there's a few a few changes there to clarify how that all works with the new terminology and new mechanisms for uh, recovery of uh, GHG costs. And so far, and I'll apologize for including quite a bit of uh, other sections in from section 11, but we, we we included all the text from the different sections that reference the energy and balance market, so that everyone would kind of have a more complete picture of, of, of everything and, you know, could think further about how, how it all should fit together. Um, but that's it for Section 11, and I'll take any other questions. All right. Not seeing questions. Let's keep moving. And uh, go to the next section, I think 27, maybe. Yep. All right. So 27 and 33.27 and Appendix B are all interrelated. And in most of the description of what what you uh, are, are would be interested in is in Appendix C. So these are the, the proposed changes to the uh, different components of the LMP. And, um, you know, not to go into all of that in, in too much detail, but you may recall from the, uh, the uh, policy initiative and the discussions around um, how each balancing authority area would, would have its own uh, marginal energy cost component calculated on a BAA perspective as opposed to an entire uh, EIM area, what's called the SMAC or System Marginal Energy Cost uh, component. And this, this was necessary in order to properly account for the transfer revenues between balancing authorities and other, other, other changes uh, in, in terms of the EDAM. And uh, you'll also find a description of these transfer system resources. So these, these are resources that are used to account for the price differences between the balancing areas and, and to uh, generate, you know, the, the, the price differences there generate the transfer revenues associated with energy cost differences between BAAs. And then, um, we also have changes to the three other components of the LMP, uh, the marginal congestion cost component. So these changes, um, they reflect the separation of the congestion from the transfer revenues and um, kind of done so in a more simplified formulation. There was quite a bit of uh, uh, formulation in, in, in Appendix C that has been uh, simplified. Then there's the marginal loss component changes, reflecting changes from the system-wide VA marginal energy cost component in order to properly account for losses. And then the greenhouse gas cost component changes to reflect the changes in the GHG design. So essentially you're, you're looking at four components that have modifications some more significant than others um, in terms of the, the, the LMP pricing. And the last uh, uh, portion of this section, Appendix C, it talks about the aggregation of generation into these um, D gap or whatever you want to call them, scheduling points outside of the market area. And, and this, is, this is again necessary for, for a, a variety of reasons in terms of the, how the transfers are accounted for 
and how the marginal energy costs and congestion costs are all accounted for. And I have now just gone way over my my market ETFs here, and I'm going to open it up for questions, and I will ask our subject matter experts for any clarifications that anyone might might be interested in hearing about in terms of the proposed changes to Appendix B, which, like I said earlier, are then related back to Section 27 and Section 33.27. So, any questions on Appendix C? Alice, do we have any questions over the phone only line? No questions on the phone at this time. Okay. Well, let's uh, move on then. And so I didn't have <clears throat> a lot to say about Appendix F. But it, it it is it is a rates and charges calculations and there's a there's a additional line in there about the systems operation charge for EDM that we included there so um, that connects back to the uh, the EDM administrative fee that's described in in more detail in section 33.11 and then more importantly um, are the uh, the new agreements that we've proposed, and uh, uh, my colleague John Spomer is out on his spring break this week, so you're not here, but I'll cover these um, individually and then and then take any questions. So the first is the EDAM implementation agreement. So for for others who may recall, in the energy imbalance market, each implementation agreement was separately negotiated and filed as an individual rate schedule um, by the ISO. The rate was always the same. It was just uh, whatever it was, three cents times the, the, the reported load for the balancing area, um, but it was a separate arrangement. So for the EDAM, because the entities are already in the EIM and just joining the EDAM, we I didn't see the need to go through all of that, and so we've modeled this agreement almost, you know, entirely on the on what was the EIM sub-entity implementation agreement. So it's a we a pro forma service agreement that we can sign, and you know, include appropriate milestones and all that, and then appropriate uh, 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 rates for in terms of the implementation fee accounting. Um, as per the ISO tariff and uh, move forward with uh, the implementation activities um, as outlined and going way back to the beginning in section uh, 33.2 of the tariff. So all of that happens under the implementation agreement. And then we have the EDAM load serving entity agreement, which is a new agreement. And again, <clears throat> This, this agreement is based on ISO sort of standard service agreements and it, it references section 33 and some of the other other uh, things that are, are specific to uh, EDAM load serving entities. Um, and in, in either of those agreements, and I can't recall which or where, but you may see some italicized language and I believe that's that's intended to be as an alternative or in addition to reflect um, either a federal entity status or a um, public power uh, uh, utility status. So non-jurisdictional utilities are have some additional italicized bracketed language um, included in those agreements. But when we get to the actual participation in the EDAM, um, here we are just proposing the addenda 
to each of the existing arrangements, and uh, and this would this would this would apply uh, across the board uh, to all of the uh, you know any interested or prospective uh, uh, EDAM entity and the associated arrangements for their participation in the extended day ahead market. And these agreements, like I said earlier, just incorporate Section 33 and then relate back and, and bring everything into one, one uh, under one umbrella, if you will. And it, this will help ensure that one-to-one -one relationship between the day ahead and real-time participation. And also, it, it does something else. So for the um, the uh, you know the jurisdictional utilities that signed you know pro forma versions of all these agreements, these addenda can be executed in their pro forma form and reported on the EQR or quarterly reporting system, and there'd be no filing with the commission. For entities that that, that were um, non-jurisdictional and had specific provisions in their arrangements to address their non-jurisdictional status, federal entity or public power entities, these, these addenda could be executed and simply filed with the commission um, in their pro forma state because in, at least in our view, all of the underlying um, uh, uh, provisions would, would apply and since we covered uh, at least everything we we thought was necessary for participation in the market when the when the when the real time market participation commenced that it should be uh, sufficient to, to move forward with this time um, based on the agenda without further um, you know negotiation or amendment but of course we'll we'll, we'll cross that road when we get there um, and so those are the four agenda. And uh, da, da, da. okay, so the last bullet um, on this slide, and I think of a day, or at least in our slide deck, is a note about um, scheduling coordinator representation uh, for submission of transmission service schedules at EDAM Interties. So this um, relates back to those sections of the tariff, mostly section 33. That we talked about earlier, and there was some discussion around um, whether these transmission customers, so an oak transmission customer, would need to uh, submit a schedule with the ISO of its transmission use in addition to whatever arrangements it may uh, have with its transmission service provider. And so the idea here is that those submissions after the registration and all of that would be submitted to the ISO by a scheduling coordinator. This could be the uh, uh, e EDAM entity um, scheduling coordinator um, representing transmission services, but we defer that to the transmission customers and their transmission service provider. But what we're saying here is that, that they are required to be represented by a scheduling coordinator. To submit those transmission schedules into the ISO system. I just wanted to make that point. Um, and I think, Isabella, correct me if I'm wrong, but that wraps up the substance of the presentation. We can go into next steps and I'll yes, take any questions. That's, that's correct. Um, so before we move into next steps, do we have any questions? Any questions on the phone only line, Silas? There are no questions on the phone line at this time. Okay, let me move into next steps here. Um, so we have some milestones laid out on this slide. Um, so comments are due on the draft tariff language on April 28th, and we do have that comment template available out on the initiative webpage for you to utilize between now and then. Um, we are asking that stakeholders attach their specific red lines to the comment template um, for each of the different sections or appendices, and then uh, provide any additional questions you may have on those sections and appendices in the text box in the template. Um, so we include instructions in the template as well, so you'll be able to refer to those. 
Um, and then some upcoming workshops. So we will hold a series of, of virtual workshops in May with the first one on May 15th, another one on May 19th, and then an additional one if we still need it on May 22nd. Um, and then planning a revised draft tariff language posting in early June and then the tariff filing for end of June. Um, so, John, did you have anything else you wanted to add here on these upcoming milestones? Yeah, no, thanks, Isabel. I, I would just emphasize, you know, the value for us in terms of focusing on, you know, red lines or, or shaded text with comments in the in the Word documents of the language that are posted. You know, that's, that's very helpful. Um, obviously, any more broad narr narrative type questions you can put in that in the in the comment template but using those word documents it helps us focus and and connect the dots and also aggregate things up by by provision or section or whatever as we need to do to facilitate those workshops in May so I would really appreciate that thing I see Sarah Thomas has her hand up so let's go ahead and unmute Sarah there. Um, these workshops, um, May 15th, 19th, and 22nd, are those going to be at all duplicative of each other, or is it really just to work through um, different issues on different days? And will there be some sort of schedule that lays out what those issues are? Yeah, good question, Sarah. So they would not be duplicative. So they would be intended to be sort of progressive. So we would start on May 15, you know, probably similar to how we went through things today, you know, with stakeholder comments um, on section 33 and kind of work our way through the material. Um, I know it's kind of painful, but we'll, we'll you know, it, it, it'll, it'll be worthwhile in the end and just kind of work our way through all the materials um, and, and hopefully, you know, get through everything, if not in the, in the first two, the 15th and 19th, but by the 22nd. And then uh, a question in the chat unrelated to the next steps, but um, will the BAA specific marginal, marginal energy cost also be used for WEIM or just EDM? The, the all of the appendix C changes flow through to the real time market. So yes, each EAA in the EIM area would now have a separate marginal energy cost for its BAA. And I'm gonna James is still on. I I hope I got that right, boy. But um, pretty sure what that's what we call the sort of the full settlement of all of these locations and transfers and, and adjustments around the, the market area. And I think that's why we use these new terms in Appendix C. One is the, I think one is called the market area, which is a combination of the EDAM area and the EIM area. And it's temporal. So in the day ahead time frame, it only includes the EDAM area. And in the real time, it includes the whole EIM area. So that's a new term market area, and I think that uh, reflects that. I'll assume I got it right since James hasn't unmuted, so we'll go from here. <laughs> I'm seeing another question in the chat just about the timing of the workshops on the 15th, 19th, and 22nd, whether or not they'll be full day or half day. Um, so we are looking at um, some half day, whether that be, you know, 10 to 2 or 1 to 4 or 5. Um, we will put out some more information um, in a notice with, with all the meeting details for those workshops. So look for that in the next uh, week or two. All right. So, and then our last slide here just is a link to the EDM initiative webpage, um, again, with the comment deadline of April 28th, um, where you will find the comment template. So that's our last slide today. Do we have any final questions before we conclude?
Any on the phone only line, Silas? None on the phone line. All right. Well, then that concludes today's call. Thank you all for joining and have a great rest of your afternoon. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.